pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the State of the City Address. It is my honor to introduce and welcome the greatest mayor we have, Joe DiStefano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, and for your kind words. And uh, it's working. Yes, it is. You know, Miguel, you and I have been partners in city government uh, for the past eight years. As we move Middletown forward, I thank you for all you do for the city and for our city. I would like to also recognize your wife, Wendy, and your family for all the time that they give, um, allow you to put towards your work here at City Hall. At this time, I'd also like to recognize my wife, Linda, uh, my mother, Teresa, and she's not Mother Teresa, but she is. <laughs> right, right. She is on Believe Sunday. Maybe she's not Mother Teresa. <laughs> my sister Maria, and I think my daughter Nicole is here also, and thank them for um, for being here and also for the same reasons. You know, this job takes a lot of time from everyone, and our families do suffer at times. Uh, welcome to all of you and to the people watching to the annual State of the City. As you know, it's required by our city charter. We don't just do this because I like to talk. So um, I would like to also recognize some of the local elected officials that are here today also. First and foremost, the top of the ladder is the Honorable Judge William DeProspo, standing in the back. I believe Maria Ingracia is here representing Congressman Maloney's office. Our county legislative uh, minority leader, Mike Paduke. And our former city councilman, now currently our uh, legislator, legislator um, replacing Jeff Berkman in his position, is Joel Sierra. <laughs> On November 7th, 2017, the residents and voters of the city of Middletown once again put their trust in me and my partner here, Miguel Rodriguez, council president, to lead our city. I would like to thank all of you who supported us those who didn't vote for us, I would like to thank you also uh, confident for your confidence and trust as we continue to move our city forward. This place that we call home, Middletown, New York, is very special to me and I'm sure very special to all of you and to the members of the Common Council. November brought some changes with it um, on the Common Council. We now have a new alderman in the second ward, uh, Andrew Green. I want to welcome Andrew to board and I know your dad is here. Your dad, Dave, is a retired member of the Middletown Police Department, and thank you, Dave, for all your service to the Middletown Police Department in the city of Middletown. Also, in the fourth ward we had a change is uh, Sparrow Tobin. Uh, Sparrow is an educator. <laughs> and watching Sparrow campaign and watching Sparrow's intensity at meetings and um, where he studies issues, he's going to be a great addition to the Common Council, and he seems like the type of person who really dives into it. So I welcome you both and thank your families also uh, for giving up their time with you so you can serve the city. Well, we welcome the new members to the Common Council. I would like to thank those who left, Kevin Witt for his years of service on the Common Council and also Vanessa Sid. Although a short term on the Common Council, Vanessa did a great job here and also added a lot to our way of thinking here in the city of Middletown. So thank you both Vanessa and Kevin. <laughs> In addition this year, the city court judge, Robert Moson, who's a former council president, former member of the common council, and currently the city court judge will be retiring. Congratulations to Judge Moson. I believe he's leaving in May, and I want to thank him personally for his years of service to the city of Middletown. <laughs> this next face on the screen will be a familiar one to all of us. It's our neighbor in the town of Walk Hill. Uh, they have new leadership. I look forward to working with Supervisor Diana um, in many, many areas, and we have many areas that we can work together on. 
most importantly, shared services. Um, this will have an create an opportunity for both cities and town to benefit from taxpayer savings. And I look forward to working with Eddie. I think we'll both have an opportunity to move things to, uh, forward between the city of Middletown and the town of Walk Hill. It's also important for me to mention the changes in the Middletown School District. It was no secret that Dr. Eastwood and I did not see eye to eye on many issues. I believe it's important to once again em emphasize that the future prosperity of this city and this community requires a strong school system, one that will continue to encourage people to buy homes here and open businesses. Despite our disagreements over the years, the city and the district continue to collaborate on many programs. I look forward to building a better relationship with the incoming superintendent, a stronger relationship with the board, and the new administration. So I, I'm, I know Kevin Gomez, who uh, I don't know if Kevin is here, but Kevin is the school district liaison with the city, and we have a very good relationship, and John Perino, the school, super, uh, school board president, and I look forward to working with them on a much closer basis over the upcoming years. Our government team here in Middletown has worked in a bipartisan manner over the past several years. I would like to thank each member of the Common Council for their past support on so many initiatives. I recognize that we have had great success working together on behalf of our city residents because of the communication process that we've established and the respect that we have for each other's opinions. At the same time, we can still be creative and assertive with individual points of view. At this time, I would like to recognize the members of the Common Council, starting with the first ward, um, Alderman Joe Massey and Alderman Tom Burr. Thank you for your job. Thanks, John. Second ward, Alderman Andrew Green, in Alder, oh, here he is. You didn't have your hat on. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for you. And <laughs> uh, Alderman Jerry Kleiner. <laughs> Third ward, Alderman Kate, Elder Women, Kate Ramkasoon, and Alderman Dr. Paul Johnson. <laughs> and in the fourth ward, Alderman Ju Jean Francois, and Alderman Sparrow Tobin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to report the city of Middletown is strong. Eight years ago, President Rodriguez and I laid out a vision that included fiscal responsibility, investing in our kids, investing in our seniors, creating opportunities for all people in our community and for all of our residents, and restoring pride in our city. I'm proud of what we have accomplished together at this point, and even better, together we're, we're positioning ourselves and we're positioning the city of Middletown for an even brighter future. If you take nothing else from my words this evening, please understand this, that the Middletown resurgence is here. And if somebody didn't stand, I'm not going to charge you a treason. I know. <laughs> I see my mother didn't stand, so she's. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I'm not going to charge her, believe me. You know, um, I grew up in this town uh, with so many special people, and Middletown was the perfect place to grow up in and also to raise my family. We have always been a city of close, close knit neighborhoods, and the American dream has been available to so many, regardless of your background. We have had our tough times, as so many um, small cities throughout our nation have had. But today, our city future is bright and lies with those who want to make positive change. Our city welcomes people of all backgrounds, and all are invited to participate and thrive in our government and in our city and in our business community. I have I've had such a wonderful time experiencing and getting to know the people from different religious backgrounds, something that this job allows you to do different ethnic groups, and people that we have here in our community. Despite all the positives, there are some naysayers when it comes to our community and to our city, and we see it in every small city. If you follow social media, there are so many people out there who would like to paint a picture of a different Middletown than the one I see, and I'm sure the one that the members of the Common Council see. Many are people who moved away. And for some reason, they believe that their move somehow makes them superior to those of us who stayed behind. 
They ignore that this community gave them opportunity and friendships and helped them on the road to their own personal success. They post Facebook ads from companies like Roadsnacks.com that rip at the very soul of our community with inaccurate facts and label us as crime ridden and other problems. They see a changing demographic as a negative, forgetting of course that our city was built upon, on the backs of the Irish, Italian and German communities and German Im immigrants. As an indicator, they see that as an indicator of what's wrong with this city. They are hateful people. That is a small minority of people I grew up with. It is disappointing when you read some of the comments from people whom you've known your entire life. Then you see the good side of people, the other people who have moved away for a variety of reasons. They share their fond memories and their public and private comments rooting for their hometown and the people that are still here in this city. They show their happiness when they come back to the city and see progress. They root for Middletown to beat Port no matter where they live. They are eager to express words of encouragement. When it comes to our city and the city they grew up in, they're hopeful, confident, and caring. Our city's future must be built upon the experiences of those positive people from yesterday, today, and tomorrow, who will join all of us by coming together to build a better city, better neighborhoods, and a better downtown, while creating opportunity for all people of all backgrounds. We will not be defined by those who are out to destroy our mission, but we will be defined by those who believe in this city and its future. It is now time to reflect on the past year and acknowledge those who make this city function on a daily basis, our employees and department heads. We will be posting on the city's website each department's annual report for more detail. And I begin with Bonnie Bernaski. Uh, Bonnie um, is our assessor, as you know. Her staff, uh, along with Bonnie, continue to run the department very efficiently. One interest, interesting statistic from her report is the amount of housing starts that were either approved, started, or completed in 2017. That number is 1,136. Our population grew by 12% in the last census, and people continue to move into our city for a variety of reasons. There's proof positive that more and more people share our future, our future vision, and want to be part of this city and this community. Moving to our city clerk, John Numchuk, he has completed his eighth year of service to our city and has done a wonderful job maintaining and updating all of city records and city websites. Our website had 150,000 hits last year, and he has also coordinated the digitizing of all city records. Today, we now have 259,000 documents scanned and imported into our laser fish system. The next one is a tough one. I think, oh, can I skip this one? <laughs> Judge, can I? Yeah. All, right. All right. The city civil service office is administered by Joseph Massey. The commission covers 329 employees of the school district. 241 employees of the city of Middletown and seven of the housing authority. This year a test for the Middletown police officer will be given and we are encouraging anyone interested in police work to contact the civil service office. We are doing extensive outreach to the minority community especially because we would like to attract and hire more black and Hispanic officers. The police department personnel should reflect as closely as possible the community in which they live in in which we live in. Chief Iwanchu has put together an outreach plan that will include meeting with minority ministers and attending school events and other recruitment opportunities to recruit potential officers. He is also planning a class, and he'll go into further detail in the future, that will be available to all applicants to help them achieve good test results and become potentially officers here in the city of Middletown. Our next office is the Office of Corporation Counsel, Rich Gerton. Uh, Rich continues with uh, his assistant, Alex Smith, to work very hard as our city attorneys. Richard worked on all the major city projects from Amy's Kitchen to the new downtown zoning. In 2016, in my state of the city, I talked about how in the prior three years, the city spent over $800,000 for outside legal counsel. 
As a result, and to save costs, we made the office full-time and have been successful in reducing the cost of outside legal counsel significantly. In 2016, the number was reduced to 226000 and in 2017 to just under $100,000. So you can see a significant savings by that very move. We can continue to monitor this department, monitor this department for additional staffing changes with the utilization of part-time attorneys and should reap additional savings in the very near future. In the area of finance, our city treasurer, Don Paris, and his deputy treasurer, Janet Gallo, continue to do excellent work. Our external audit and management letter continues with no adjustments or negative comments. Our board of estimate made up of myself, Council President Rodriguez, and Alderman Massey, the finance chairman, work very closely with Mr. Paris to monitor city expenses, along with monitoring uh, vacancy reviews, uh, meaning that we examine each vacancy in the city to determine whether that position should be filled. We have once again stayed below the governor's 2% tax cap for the fifth consecutive year. This is significant in many ways, but mostly because it qualifies us for the state rebate that I think many people have just received in the mail. We now accept credit card payments, although we're having a little bit of a problem with it, and they have successfully, successfully implemented the new water meter program. If you're a senior and living in the city of Middletown or in the Middletown community, you must check out the Mulberry House Senior Center. Director Julissa Sierra has done a wonderful job expanding the program and the number of participants. We now have 2,651 senior citizens registered in this program, and that's an increase of 200 over 2016. Activities from the Breakfast Club, the Senior Express Band, health fairs, and more offer opportunities for our seniors to stay active in our community. My mother is a participant in the senior program and she can attest firsthand for the uh, successful programs that they are operating there. We have 64 volunteers at the center making a difference by assisting with computer support, exercise class, and office work. AARP meets there in this, at the center and the center also hosts many outside agencies such as the Middletown Art Group, Middletown Lions Club, and is also used as an emergency warming and cooling station during bad weather. The senior bus, the one that you can look at, is, has close to 200,000 miles on it. It does deliver a lot of people, and um, the, Julissa has requested that we replace the bus, and if it wasn't for Joel doing some free work for her on the bus, it probably wouldn't be operating. But um, I am requesting that in this year's capital plan that we fund a new senior bus for our seniors along with some additional improvements at the senior center. Uh, most importantly, I think some handicap accessibility issues and uh, I believe the Common Council will support that, Julissa. So we'll have that done very quickly for you. Our Recreation Department and Parks Department remains the most active municipal recreation department in the county. Chris Brinkerhoff and her staff have really expanded the amount of programs offered and the type of programs. Parks and Rec is no longer looked upon as strictly athletics. The Teen Center is thriving and program, programs such as Cops and Cookies, Santa Paws, Stuff the Bus, and so many more are big hits. We utilize some of the school district properties for after school and weekend programs, as I referenced earlier, the collaboration between the city and the school district. These include cheerleading, indoor soccer, boxing, and our new toddler and training at Presidential Park, focusing on coordination, flexibility, and socialization for three and four year olds. There are not a lot of recreation departments in this valley that are doing these types of programs. Currently, the city has 16 parks with approximately 245 acres of parkland. This includes the expansion of Fancher Davidge Park. Last year, we purchased 50 acres of land contiguous to Davidge heading across Ingracia Road. This land will be used to expand the nature trails and bird sanctuary that now exists there. The Heritage Trail will go right through this property. Off Monhagen Avenue, the city has 11 acres of property, and that property has been cleared 
filled, fenced, and seeded for future ball field expansion and no expense to city taxpayers. We worked out a deal for construction equipment storage for 14 months in exchange for approximately $1 million of work that was done at the site. In order to make this a ball field, we are going to rely heavily on grants. We have opened up a dialogue with our assemblywoman, Aileen Gunther, who has been so supportive of our recreation and senior programs, and we're working on grant opportunities with her office, and we hope to have an announcement in the very near future. The site is now ready to be developed. All we need is the money, and I think we're going to have some good news in the near future. Our 2018 goals include the complete the completion and the expansion of Davidge Park and other park improvements throughout the system. Maple Hill has recently been improved with $160,000 in new equipment, and we will be completing the walking trails at Maple Hill and add more shade trees to the very successful dog park there. I see John Bianchi, our, our foreman in the back there, and John is um, overseeing those programs along with Chris. How we utilize our park system is important. We want to protect as much of the natural land as possible. We also want to enjoy the property. Last year, we added the downtown skate park to our recreational system, and it's been a huge success. This year, we will, we will be adding a disc golf course in the rear of Davidge Park, along with pickleball at Maple Hill. I don't know what pickleball is. <laughs> so you have to call 346-4180 and ask them what pickleball is. I don't know. Uh, we have restored sleigh riding and ice skating um, in our parks and look to improve on our winter outdoor recreational offerings, something I've been trying to do for, for many, many years. We will continue to focus on playground equipment and replacement at the Jerome Neal, Bennett Hills, Sprout, Beatty Hill, and Hampshire Parks. <coughs> we have had requests for a lacrosse program, and I know that Chris and her staff are very focused on implementing that also. This next part is near and dear to many of our hearts. Um, our community lost a fine man last April. Not a day went by that Robert Isaacs wasn't seen walking in our parks or playing with his grandson Patty at one of them. Bob was a longtime defender of our city in so many ways. He was a former assistant corporation counsel and city court judge. He served as special counsel to the city for many years. He loved our city and he was an advocate for improving our park system and was on a daily basis would give me his critique of each park. The city parks employees completed a new pavilion at Maple Hill Park shortly after Bob passed. A park employee, uh, Sean Reisert, who saw Bob in the park so many times suggested that we name the pavilion after him. That's a great way to honor a great man. I am requesting that the Common Council do just that, approve the Robert Nathan Isaacs Pavilion at Maple Hill Park. I, I called what his wife Judy yesterday and um, spoke with his daughter Sophie, and, and they would be so honored um, to have that name in, in after Bob. Uh, we are very proud of the collaboration between the Recreation and Parks Department and so many agencies for the benefit of our residents. Special thanks to the Mayor's Youth Council, to Eagle Scout Joseph Grazioso, and the many volunteers and employees who have done and who do so much to offer our residents this in this wonderful recreation and park system. I want to thank all of them for all their assistance and all their volunteering. Let's move on to the Middletown Fire Department. Chief Lewis, who is not in uniform tonight, but he's in uniform in the picture. We began 2018 with the swearing in of a new fire chief, Chief Don Lewis. Uh, chief Lewis has been involved with the Middletown Department for many, many years. He will uphold the trust, he will uphold the values of the department, which include respect, trust, support, and dedication. I would also like to thank former Chief Sam Barone for his dedication to the city and to the Middletown Fire Department. In 2017, the department responded to 916 calls for service. 
we continue to offer a very successful fire prevention program, and the department collaborates with other city agencies, such as the police and recreation departments, in presenting pop-up barbecues throughout our community, health clinics, and community events. Our combined paid volunteer system saves millions of dollars per year. The system continues to work, and volunteer participation has been maintained and improved in some areas, and the paid department has just added two new firefighters. This year, we are replacing the Monhagen Company truck, number one. The bid was awarded to Campbell Fire LLC of Orange County, and delivery is expected by the end of 2018. I want to thank all the Middletown uh, volunteers in our Middletown Fire Department. I want to welcome Chief Lewis to the top reins of the Middletown Fire Department. We've worked together for many, many years, and I'm sure we're going to have a great working relationship as we move forward. Uh, 2017, uh, we said goodbye to Chief Raymond Bethencourt, who retired 20, after 25 years of service, along with Bureau Commander of Services Greg Matakis, with almost 30 years of service. Let me thank both of them for their dedication and hard work that they have brought uh, with them when they were here in the city of Middletown. We immediately moved, without any hesitation, to appoint Lieutenant John Iwanchu to the position of the Chief of Police of the City of Middletown Police Department. Chief Iwanchu is a graduate of the prestigious FBI Academy, and I welcome him to his new position as Chief of the Middletown Police Department. While policing has traditionally been a male-dominated profession, the city has made tremendous strides over the past several years to change that. I am proud to announce that the Middletown Police Commission recently named its first female supervisor, a person very familiar to our residents and who, along with Officer Hargett, was responsible for our agency's compliance with the rigorous standards required for the Middletown Police Department to once again earn full accreditation. Congratulations to Sergeant Jackie Welch, Jacqueline Welch, and I want to congratulate her on being the first female promoted to a supervisory position. <laughs> Chief Iwancho recognizes that, the, that police work is much more than arresting people. Our crime statistics continue to trend downward, as you can see by the graph. Chief has talked about the main issue facing departments around the country, whether large or small, village or large city, and that is community relations and confidence in the police agency. The public across the country has demanded more accountability and professionalism, and the Middletown Police Department delivers in that area. The chief has developed an approach to improve community relations, to expand community policing, and to work with community organizations and the public he has created the pop-up barbecue program where the officers randomly select a park within city limits and have a barbecue with the people who are living in that area or were living in that area. They have an opportunity to interact with kids and their parents, along with the police and community to get to know each other in a non-adversarial way. He demands that each officer under his command treat every individual with respect, dignity, and professionalism. The men and women of the Middletown Police Department have lived up to those expectations, to his expectations. As we move forward into 2018, we have listened to the community feedback regarding better communication with the public during emergencies. We currently use social media, websites, Channel 20, and other forms of communication to get the word out. We recognize that people are busy and don't have time to check, to sign in and check their websites or to check their computer about what is happening in their community. So what we have done this year under the Chief's uh, guidance, in order to provide the best communication possible between our community, primarily the police, and the public, we are implementing an emergency notification system through the Middletown Police Department. This will operate similar to the reverse 911 system. The system will have three levels of priorities 
to provide context and information to the public. The highest level emergency notifications would be for incidents like a missing child, severe weather, evacuation notice, gas leaks, etc. The second level would be non-emergency advisories. Those are intended to communicate important need to know information such as water main breaks, school closings, boil water alerts, and road closures. And the third level is community involvement. The notifications will let the, people, will let the public know about meeting notices, recycling pickups, snow emergencies, parade routes, and more. Residents will have five ways to register for this notification, and a Nixle app will be available. Why is this all important? The reasons I just listed above are obvious ones, but I would like to utilize this technology to approach some other issues. For example, we are a city of 28,000 people in five square miles. Our older neighborhoods have 50 to 75 foot wide lots. We currently have on-street parking ban from November until April, five months out of the year, and this forces people to make some undesirable choices. In today's world, almost everyone has a car, and where do you park all these cars in neighborhoods that have small lots? What has been happening more frequently is the front yard. It's not what we want, not what I want. It looks bad, but the law kind of forces you to do it, even on days when there's no snow on the ground. People don't understand when they get a ticket for parking on the street, and it's 55 degrees in January with no snow. Neighbors don't like it because it detracts from their homes. We could enforce the ban on parking on front lawns, but is it fair when there is no alternative available? I would like the Common Council to explore alternate side of the street parking or a form of it on a year-round basis and have it implemented in time for the winter of 2018-2019. If they can do this in large cities, why not here? With this emergency notification, we can issue snow emergencies. We can educate people to sign up for the Nixel system and notify them directly to remove their cars off city streets. We can also declare snow emergencies and have a way to notify the public. So there are ways through education and through technology to keep our streets clear for snow emergencies while at the same time not forcing people to park on front lawns. Using the Nixel system, we can make this work. Before I leave the police department, I also wanted to acknowledge the two new bureau commanders, Lieutenant Frank Graziano and Lieutenant Jeff Tholen, both uh, new to the bureau commander business here in the state of Middletown and part of Chief Awancho's team. So welcome to both. In the area of economic development, 2018 will be the year we see the fruits of our labor of the past several years. Our director, Maria Bruni, has once again completed a successful year. She continues to manage the several programs under her purview very effectively. Let's begin with the DRI, also known as the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, which is the $10 million grant that we received through Governor Cuomo's office to revitalize downtown Middletown. As you know, this was a competition that was created under the governor in the city of Middletown One. In May of 2017, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul announced the projects that were selected for funding. For the past almost two years, you have heard a lot of talk about it. Now comes the action, and these are the six projects that were funded. This is a picture of the Woolworths Building as it sat for 20 plus years. We are transforming this building. This is under construction and will be completed by early summer of this year. This is a two and a half million dollar project. The project also includes what is called a race for space component. It's a competition for tenants who will receive a $20,000 grant for build out and also a 50% rent subsidy, all funded through the state of New York. We will be creating a competition for the four businesses that could locate into this facility and that will be, be coming, uh, coming forth shortly through Maria's office. And we'll have a competition to select the winners. Um, as you can see, if you can go back, maybe just on a, that's the back of the building. There's the center of the building. That right there is where the Heritage Trail is going to connect from Orchard Street over to North Street. 
and then it will span out from there. So it's going to be a very attractive facility. The total cost is about three and a half million dollars in that whole area. Um, majority of it is funded through either the DRI money or previous grants through Senator Bonasek and Assemblywoman Gunther. And the pictures that you actually see are the ones, that's how it's going to look. Um, I know people, uh, when I show it to them, they say, ah, no way, no way. But that's it. We're spending the money. It will be, I believe, completed, Jacob, by June, June or July. And we hope to have a ribbon cutting then. Part two of the funding went to a facade and storefront program. And it's a $1 million grant. And we will fund facade improvements up to $75,000. And that would be funded with 75% of the project cost. So someone who has a $100,000 worth of work on their building will have a $75,000 grant through the state of New York under this program. We had 35 applicants, more applicants than we have money. We're hoping to have around two. Uh, selection of the uh, buildings will be made, I believe, in February. We have a committee of five uh, with no political influence in this. We hired a historic architect, A.J. Capolo, to do the um, write-ups on the buildings. And it's going to be an amazing thing that we're going to be able to turn around so many of these buildings. We're hoping in the area of 15 to 17 buildings, the facades will be completed and renovated. One, I think that you'll all agree, uh, we're hoping, and he did apply, is the Nina's building, the old Bulls Opera House. So we're hoping that we're able to um, change that building along with several buildings on North Street, and we look forward to spending this money this year. The streetscape is the third opportunity of, for funding, and that's to promote pedestrian activity. This has been coordinated with our Commissioner of Public Works, Jacob Tuwil, and DPW to utilize about $2.3 million in DRI funding, combined with about $7.5 million in traffic operations money that will be spent throughout the city for traffic intersections, and $2.7 million in sidewalk grant money from Senator Schumer. Uh, this will address sidewalks, improve lighting, and trees and plantings throughout our downtown and at any intersection throughout our city that has a traffic light. They will also be handicap accessible. They will have um, uh, pedestrian crossing lights, the latest technology. Uh, again, making Middletown walkable and bikeable. But it's a big, big emphasis on the downtown area. The project will start on Wickham Avenue by uh, the railroad tracks. So you'll see some major improvement coming down Wickham Avenue around Thrall Park, Grove Street, and up onto Railroad. Um, up Wickham to Highland, um, down Franklin, and I believe down West Main and parts of, um, uh, from Wickham down to, uh, uh, down West Main, right into the downtown. Going to be a major, major impact on the visual of when you pull into the city of Middletown. Part four is the Erie Way Park and the pavilion. Uh, we hired the design engineer who has already started the design work. These were the renderings that were submitted with the grant. We expect it to look something like that, but with, a, of course, a lot more detail. And part five is the parking and green space improvements. Again, we have hired and retained the engineer, the design engineer. This project will include green infrastructure uh, practices designed to storm mitigation, including tree plantings and LED lighting, and the tree plantings to also control um, water runoff. And the last part of the grant is branding and wayfinding signage. This is, um, we expect to get to that near the end of the completion of these other first five projects. Two other downtown projects that you've heard of quite a bit about will be happening in 2018, and you've seen it before in previous state of the cities, is the Transportation Center. This is the, um, again, a rendering of the, um, of the area. It's in the vicinity of the current coach bus terminal on Railroad Avenue. When you pull in there now and you get off a bus now and it's your first impression of Middletown, it's not a very good impression. So this will be an entirely new transportation center with buses off the road. There will be covered bus terminals and, and I believe it's a two to four million dollar project um, along with a uh, private commuter lot for uh, and encouraging commuters. Our job will be to get those commuters out of that lot and into our businesses in the downtown area. 
It took a, lo a little bit longer to finalize because the project has expanded. Uh, this will include uh, the legal documents have now been agreed to, and the project has received planning board approval, and construction is scheduled for 2018. The second project, what we've been talking about and dreaming about for over 20 years, is the Heritage Trail. Some expect us to, build, uh, to still be talking about it and dreaming about it for another 20 years. Um, to those, I say that's not true because we are really moving on this project. The phase two segment from Hartley Road to East Main Street is on schedule. Myself, Jacob, and Rich Gurton had an update on Friday with the uh, county officials um, and along with Amy's officials because, as you know, Amy's kitchen is along this route. Amy's is starting the pipe installation by March, and the county will be right behind them, and we expect by summer they will be coming into the city of Middletown. We need to recognize once again the excellent work and assistance of our county executive Steve, Newh Steve Newhouse that he did to make this work. Also, the Middletown Trail advocates have played a key role in holding people's feet to the fire. We continue to meet on a design phase from East Main Street to West Main Street through the Woolworth Building in downtown up to Davidge Park. And that part has not received final design approval. But the construction to East Main Street will be happening in 2018. Speaking of downtown, John Degnan is our Assistant Economic Development Director and Executive Director of the Business Improvement District. John has worked very closely with all of us here at City Hall, developing the DRI plan and addressing the four pillars of our downtown redevelopment, beautification, safety, sanitation, and promotion. John and staff coordinate all of the events in downtown, the farmer's market, the summer concert series, the run for downtown, the annual, annual tree lighting, and more. When you look at projects like the former Tompkins building, which is under construction, that's, those are real pictures. Above is what it looked like a few months ago on the left side, and below is what it's starting to look like now. This building has been a symbol of Middletown's deterioration over many, many years because of its emotional ties to the community. And by this summer, you will be walking into a building that you will not believe your eyes when you get in there. And uh, I, I know that uh, Isabel and her husband are going to have a, a big grand opening. It's going to be an antique restoration, an antique hall, and I believe the total investment is close to $4 million here on North Street on a building that sat for 35 years and did nothing but you see in the upper left-hand picture. Other projects uh, that we have completed was a skate park. We have the Woolworths project going. The Equilibrium project was completed and so much more. And we realize and recognize the seven-day-a-week effort by Maria and John and a whole host of volunteers from the bid board, the IDA board, the Run for Downtown board, and the planning board. All of these people are not paid. None of these people are paid on any of these boards. And they really deserve a round of applause for all they've done to move these projects. I'm getting there. The redevelopment of the former psychiatric center grounds has been a major focus for us. Jacob is focused on infrastructure upgrades that will and have made the campus desirable for development. We have been awarded $500,000 to begin the replacement of the 20-inch water line high-pressure water main from the water plant to the former MPC campus. The total project cost us $3 million and design work has started. A second grant of $500,000 has been awarded by the governor to clean up the area devastated by the fire from a few years ago. What this does is it jumpstarts the redevelopment of this campus. And this commitment to improved infrastructure has done just that. Have you been up to the campus lately? If not, let me tell you what's happening. Faytian College and Academy have purchased several buildings at MPC. They currently have both high school and college students on campus. Faytian Academy is projecting 600 high school students, grades 6 through 12, while Faytian College is projecting 2,700, yes, 2,000 
700 college students over the next five years. The renovations of the former Woodman Hall, a 79,000 square foot building abandoned by the state many years ago, are currently underway, as you can see in the pictures. This is a three-phase project for this building. Phase one is expected to be completed later this year. This will provide space for integrating both modern Western and time-honored Eastern medical practices. Phase two and three will provide space for research and education, all affiliated with the college. Fei Tien joins SUNY Orange and Toro Medical as higher education institutions located in the city of Middletown that call the city of Middletown home. This May, Toro College, the first graduating class of Toro College, Toro Medical School, will be marching and they will be marching down the aisles at the Paramount Theater. This is a picture of the first class from four years ago. As you know, Toro came to Middletown for a number of reasons, but one big one was the million dollar grant through Governor Cuomo. I know the governor has been invited to attend this historic event in our city, and we are hopeful he will be able to attend to witness firsthand the positive impact his policies have had on our small city. I would like to thank Governor Cuomo for the DRI money, for the $500,000 at the Psych Center, for the $500,000 for the mains, for the three million for other, um, uh, the, the amount of grant money coming into the city is unbelievable. And I just need to at least recognize that the governor's policies are really working effectively for the city of Middletown. <laughs> Another initiative of the governor is the additional property at the Middletown Psych Center. Um, as you know, through previous administrations, state administrations, they have done nothing with the property. It's just continued to deteriorate. We've had several fires and the buildings just sat there. Soon we will be closing on the purchase of 13 buildings and 35 acres of property at the campus at the Middletown Psychiatric Center. And we are purchasing that property from the state of New York for $1. I don't want to mislead anyone. Some of these buildings come with environmental issues and they've been fully disclosed. Our approach is aggressive, but we have demonstrated the ability to make this campus work. And we have partnered with the state of New York to make this campus work. We can sit back and watch the buildings continue to deteriorate, or we can take control of the property and make it productive with a large economic impact for our city. This is an exciting opportunity for us. On the other end of town, the econ another economic development focus is the industrial area off of Midland Avenue. Michelson Studios has made a major investment in a 60,000 square foot film and stage studio. The, transfer the transformation of the former railroad buildings is unbelievable. More can and be done in that area, can and should be done in that area. The property owner, Israel Eisendorfer, has been working very closely with us to improve the old and unused buildings on his property to attract a variety of different businesses. Currently, he has Amazon and a few other businesses located um, in the buildings. But it's necessary for us to partner with him on the public improvement side, and the property owners must commit to the interior road structure. This is a valuable piece of property in the city of Middletown that is underutilized and is not generating as much tax revenue or jobs as it could. I am requesting that the Common Council fund curbs and sidewalks up Midland Avenue from Wisner to help in this process. This should include a decorative entrance to the industrial park area so we can define it. So people, when they come there, they see that the city is partnering with the private owners to improve this property and attract viable businesses. We will, be going, we will once again examine the viability of opening the, up the interior road, connecting industrial place with Midland Avenue, and it's separated currently by the railroad tracks. Mr. Eisendorfer continues to improve his complex, and we must do our part and our public part to make it more attractive for those businesses. We should also look at this site as a potential opportunity zone under the recently passed Tax Act. We are acquiring information on there appears to be a designation. This area qualifies under the 
um, census tract data that we've been able to determine at this point. We have opened up a, um, a dialogue with the governor's office to see what the process is. And I know Maria has been working with Empire State Development. And we're hoping that if this downtown, or if this opportunity zone is as good as the feds are promoting it, that this will be a major boom for that section of town. But we need to make the investment there. We move on to the Paramount Theater. It continues to be our downtown anchor. It is the cornerstone of our growing downtown entertainment destinations. We now host the filming of the Jimmy Stir RFD TV show, as well as, a, as an extensive list of live entertainment. Just a cheap commercial. Uh, the Young Islanders, Oak Ridge Boys, and Three Dog Night. Tickets are on sale now. The Young Islanders are there on March 17th. And uh, Oak Ridge Boys tickets are selling pretty good also. So uh, support the Paramount. If you're looking for more live entertainment in our area, you need to support the theater. We are also hosting business seminars along with first run movies. The movie attendance is up 24%, as you'll see, I think, on the graph. And we have a classic movie series that is also very popular. Before I, need to, before I move on, I need to mention um, a program that started about a year and a half ago um, under Maria's office, and that is the Community Development Home Buyer Program. We have now completed four homes. You see the before and after. Three of the phones, uh, homes are now occupied by families with significant grant monies through the state and through local banks and working with the city. Um, and it, it's just a tremendous program. So if you're looking to own a home or know anyone looking to own a home, this is a tremendous opportunity to get into a home at a very affordable price. You can contact the Economic Development Office. Now onto our largest department, and that's Jacob Tawil. Jacob continues to shine in his role as commissioner and advisor. I would like to recognize also some of the work of his people under Jacob, uh, one being Doug Hendrickson. Uh, Doug has retired this past year and has been replaced by Mark Pengel, um, a longtime city employee. And I believe also Chris Gross, uh, the other deputy commissioner is here. Chris is in the back. Thank you for your service to the city, Chris. I thought I saw smiley Mark Pengel, too. He's back there. There he is. Stand up and say hello. <laughs> he won't stand up. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. You know, code enforcement is such a critical part uh, of, of our mission here um, as elected officials um, and for any city. In 2017, we added one new uh, code enforcement officer. Our annual rental permit program continues, and the amortization of multifamily homes in residential areas is moving forward. Many of our city streets have been torn up by the gas line replacement program conducted by Orange and Rockland. 2017 was the start of reclaiming our streets. If you noticed, we paved almost nine miles of city streets reclaiming those streets this past year. And the program moving forward will follow uh, probably a year or so after the Orange and Rockland moves off of your block. We want to make sure, I know it's a frequent question, we want to make sure the, the, it settles, the, uh, and that's why we don't come and pave it immediately. So we wait at least a year before we pave, but I know Bedford Avenue and other streets, uh, uh, people are very appreciative that we finally got to it. But uh, the program will continue into the near future until we cover all of the streets that Orange and Rockland tore up. We continue with our annual spring cleanup program. Uh, last year, we collected 740 tons of junk from your garages and your backyards. Our recycling program continues at a dismal 6% participation rate, and that needs to improve. Um, I know the council president assigned Alderman Jude Jean-Francois uh, to take on that task, and one of Jude's recommendations to me is that we pick up recycling every week regardless of holidays. While this will require an additional outlay of money, I have come to the conclusion and agree with Alderman uh, Jean-Francois and will ask the Common Council to fund recycling pickup on a 52-week basis beginning this month. So we need to... Uh, yeah. My friend, the legislator, is one of the most frequent complainers, and he clapped. 
we continue to examine alternatives to our current sanitation system. Um, this is a complex issue that requires union cooperation, but it is still stuck on the negotiation level with the CSEA contract. While I've supported the use of the truck with the arm, others have supported privatization. The union came to us with a proposal and they put privatization on the table. They said, we want X, Y, and Z in exchange for privatization. I agreed. Now it's time for the union, after they went public with some false uh, accusations, they must put this deal that they negotiated into, a, into their committee in front of their membership for a vote. Then and only then can we move in, in a way to give our employees a fair contract. It is unconscionable that union officers would sit in an office, negotiate a deal, ask for something, and then walk away and not even give the opportunity to their membership to vote. After they went public, they, of course, didn't anticipate that we would respond, and we did. Now they're asking that we shut up. I'm not going to. They need to put this to a vote of their membership. If their membership says no, then we can reopen negotiations. But it is not fair to negotiate against ourselves as a city. I want our employees to have a fair contract. Uh, these are the people that are picking up your garbage. Uh, they're plowing your streets. You saw some of the pictures um, in you know six foot holes uh, with uh, water lines. They deserve a fair contract but their leadership has let them down. And their leadership needs to recognize that when you make a deal during business negotiations or union negotiations, that you have an obligation to bring that contract forward. Immediately, as it, when they bring it forward and it's ratified or not ratified, I will then bring that contract to the Common Council and ask that it be ratified. So there's a, it's a two-way street and the union has to recognize that, that they have a role and they have an obligation to negotiate fairly. must be noted that we have two other labor unions, both police and fire department. Both have contracts. Police contract has reopened already, um, and I anticipate settling that contract this year. So there is no reason why we can't settle the CSEA contract if we treat each other with respect and, and fulfill our obligations at the negotiation table. We recognize that there are parts of the city where traffic has become a problem, primarily the South End and County Route 78 area. We are installing a roundabout at the intersection of James P. Kelly Way and County Route 78. The estimated cost is $1.6 million. There are grants covering 80% of the project costs. I know Jacob has been at this project for quite a while. It is being constructed to provide a safer and more efficient intersection with traffic calming mechanisms. Green infrastructure will once again be utilized. The project has been advertised for bid and construction should proceed this year. We are also adding curbs and sidewalks on Dolson Avenue to the city line, ending the play tags goat, goat path once and for all. Our infrastructure, including our water and sewer systems, are our most valuable assets. Our underground system of water, sewer, and drainage is old, in some cases over 100 years old. Pipes and valves need to be replaced. The water department responded to 31 water breaks, water main breaks in 2017. That's in, it's, it's a number that needs to be reduced, and it can only be reduced with an infrastructure program. It is important to continue to upgrade the miles and miles of raw water lines, sewer lines, and drainage. It is costly. One project, the Black Dirt Sewer off Lake Avenue, serving the Presidential Park School and going out towards Monhagen Avenue, received a $1 million grant. The total project cost is $3.9 million, and that construction will hopefully be completed or at least begin uh, be completed in 2018, 2019. But you can see the massive amount of investment that is required to repair the infrastructure that you don't see on a daily basis. Our raw water transmission lines outside the city limits that bring water into our system are a key part of our reservoir system. We have begun plans to replace these key lines to, uh, due to their age and size of the pipes. Our plan is also to capture more water. Maple Hill, Maple Hill Park, 
and West Main Street drainage improvements in the amounts of $1.48 million and $1.18 million are due for a bid opening this month. This again was grants through the uh, uh, federal government and Rich Mayfield, I don't believe Rich is here tonight, but Rich and the county government really helped us with this project. This will include reestablishing and reinforcing the Monhagen Brook, the banks that eroded during the Lee and Sandy storms. That's how long this money took us to get. And also include the creation of a detention pond in Maple Hill Park. This will have a tremendous impact in preventing the flooding issues in that area. We continue to work with FEMA to maximize the grants required to upgrade and create a more resilient city storm water system to protect our homes and property from the new norm, and their new norm is now megastorms. We recently have been awarded 544000 to replace underground lead water services into private homes by the New York State Department of Health. Please call and inquire about your eligibility if you suspect you have lead pipes. We have two grant applications pending in the amount of $5.5 million for the water tanks. Jacob has for years advocated for more protection of our reservoir system, including increased watershed protection. We retain the firm CDM to develop a watershed protection plan that would include the acquisition of, our, of property in our watershed area. After Newburgh and Hoosick Falls, upstate New York, there has been much more emphasis on watershed protection. We applied through Governor Cuomo's office with the assistance of Senator Bonasek and Assemblywoman Gunther for a grant to acquire property in the area of Kinch Dam, our major watershed area. The grant was awarded in the amount of $3.1 million and we're moving forward with the plans to protect our watershed area under the direction of Commissioner Tawil. There are many other projects for which we have received funding. My point here is we are working diligently in our underground infrastructure and utilizing grant opportunities along with our ability to match these grants with local funding to give us more options as we move forward. These funding sources include the treatment of septage from, from haulers that generated over one half a million dollars in 2017, a to wheel idea. The sale of potable water to Amy's Kitchen that will bring in approximately $800,000 per year and the CPV deal, the sale of treated sewage, also known as gray water, that will generate in the area of five to $600,000 a year. These are the monies that will be used to offset the cost of the infrastructure projects that I just posted. Our agreement with Way Beyond to sell 200,000 gallons of water and sewer service per day is expanding and creating more revenue. When fully implemented, the existing agreement will generate over $1 million annually into our water and sewer funds. As you can see, we have put a business model in place that will offset many of the costs of improving our systems. Not sure about all, but I think many, and it's working. Let me now re briefly respond to those who oppose the CPV plant and remind all who continue to point the finger at the city of Middletown for the presence of the CPV plant and the CPV project that CPV is not in the city of Middletown. It is in the town of Wabianda. Middletown made this project greener by saving the aquifer and selling CPV treated <coughs> sewage rather than having CPUs potable groundwater. I don't know an environmentalist in the world that would say if this project is happening that their preference would be to use groundwater from the aquifer over using treated sewage from a neighboring community. We made the project greener. They have to accept that. Like any industrial or commercial project, whether it's Amy's Kitchen in Goshen or RSR in Walkhill, we all breathe the same air. New York is a home rule state, thus giving local control for this project to the town of Wayweyanda, with approvals required by the county, state, and federal regulatory agencies. There were many hurdles for CPV to cross, starting with the Walkhill Town Board and the Walkhill Planning Board, the EPA, the DEC, and other regulatory bodies. Then we have the courts, and the project opponents continue that battle, as is their right. CPV has provided us with all the relevant safety information on the project to date, and we are confident that the above agencies will do and have done their job appropriately. We will, of course, continue to monitor the project, make sure that Middletown residents, as we would monitor any project in, um, in our area, that Middletown residents are not negatively impacted. And if so, we are prepared to take action. If they don't comply, the courts are the great equalizer. 
Jacob continues to be innovative in his approach to green energy. We have signed and have implemented an energy performance contract that included the purchase of all street lights with a conversion to LEDs that's underway, along with a quicker repair response time for our street light repairs. New water meters that will alert homeowners of leaks and enable them to monitor their usage. And upgrades of city facilities with long-term energy savings. Total project cost was $12.6 million, and the work is bonded and guaranteed to have a savings and a return in a 15-year period. Construction is to be completed in 2018. Uh, we are hopeful that the electric car charging stations will be part of our downtown parking scene this summer. And as part of our green energy platforms, we installed a, um, a ground-mounted 56 kW solar system at the water treatment plant this year to supplement the plant energy consumption. We plan to do more in the area of solar, and construction on that is to be completed in 2018. As you can see, we are committed to the green energy plan. When I meet with students, especially young kids, they always ask that generic question, uh, what do you do? Just what do you do as mayor? At times, I would give them a long-winded answer, such as we spend 55 to $60 million a year, we plow your streets, we pick up your garbage, the police come to your neighborhood, the fire trucks are there, we operate water and sewer, but that's only part of the job as I see it. I look at my responsibilities and the responsibilities of the member of the Common Council, and I'm sure they would agree that all of what I just said is very, very important. But we must meet the current needs of our constituents by providing all of the above. We all understand that. I started adding a second part a few years ago when I tell people what I do as mayor is that we need to plan for our communities tomorrow. That has been the major focus of mine and Council President Rodriguez, and to a certain extent, Alderman Massey as a member of the Board of Estimate. That's been our plan for the past eight years. The Indigo Water Taking Agreement is an agreement for tomorrow. The water and sewer plants, the 60 plus million dollar investment, that's an investment in tomorrow. Our infrastructure upgrades are tomorrow. Our reservoir protection is for tomorrow but we have to begin planning for them and implementing them today. We are excited about what have we, have, we are excited about what we have accomplished these past eight years. I hope to be able to serve you for the next eight years also. 2018 is going to bring with it a new Middletown. I hope when you see the changes that will be happening right before your eyes in 2018, it will make you proud to be a resident of this community that we call home. Thank you very much. I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>